Well, it's good to see everyone here this evening. If you'll turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 8, we will continue where we left off last time. We had noted the first three of the uh, trumpets uh, in our t- study last week as the seventh seal was opened and the trumpets began to sound. And uh, we just kind of want to remind ourselves of what it is that we're looking at here and maybe what we're not looking at. We're not looking at chronology. Uh, And I think this question was raised, but it's always good to remind ourselves of that. Uh, This is not a history lesson. This is not, this will happen, then this, then this, then this. Even though it's presented as a series of trumpets, that's not the point of it. Uh, The point is that it's the same picture over and over again, different facets, different presentations. And so there is one way to describe God's judgment on Rome as throwing fire upon the earth, and that kind of uses a certain set of images. But you can also describe it in terms of the plagues on Egypt, just like God was judging that idolatrous nation that held his people captive, so God's going to destroy this one as well. And that's not something that happens after the first trumpet, it's the same thing, just described with different imagery. But you could also describe that very same thing in verses 10 and 11, as if it were a great star falling from heaven and uh, polluting all of the waters and uh, everything becoming bitter as a result of this. Uh, That's just another way of describing it. It's another image, but it is the same judgment. And so we shouldn't think of these as uh, a sequence of events and not start asking, well, when did this one happen and when did that one happen? They're all generic pictures of the destruction that God is going to bring. And when we read about famines and things like that, uh, I seriously doubt if John has any particular famine in mind or is pointing to some particular famine in some part of the Roman Empire that would happen. No, uh, famine is a typical way that God punishes wicked people And I think that's the point of it when we read that kind of stuff, that these images of judgment from the Old Testament are just kind of piled on top of each other so that we uh, see the effect and remember that we get the idea here of um, uh, judgment. And uh, another way to say all that is that these are literary and symbolic representations of what God is going to do. They are not necessarily literal historical events. And so, you know, there's no need to go through ancient astronomical records and ask, was there a comet in a certain year or a star that was seen that we can match up with chapter 8 and verse 10? No, there wasn't a star that fell from heaven. Uh, It is literary, symbolic depictions of what God is going to do. Uh, And so we get another facet of it uh, as we look at verses uh, 12 and 13, the sounding of the fourth trumpet, and I think we'll probably do well tonight to look at the fourth and the fifth trumpets uh, as we go through this series here. So in chapter 8 and verse 12, the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun and a third of the moon and a third of the stars were struck so that a third of them would be darkened, and the day would not shine for a third of it, and the night in the same way. Uh, This is something that is, again, common in biblical descriptions of God's destructions of wicked people or wicked nations. The idea that God's going to shut things down, that the sun's not going to shine, and that weird things are going to be seen, that the universe is going to be, as it were, out of whack, and it's going to be obvious that something is wrong someplace. Uh, That's the idea. And it's not, again, that we should look for this to happen on a calendar in some point in ancient history. It's figurative and symbols. Uh, And, of course, like just about everything else we've looked at, it is rooted in Old Testament scenes. Remember the ninth plague on Egypt, uh, God put the Egyptians in the dark for a few days to show that, again, uh, they were powerless. One of the great gods of the Egyptians was the sun god. And so God kind of puts the lights out on the Egyptians to show them that your god is nothing. And uh, we're going to see here in our text tonight, I think, that there is some of that 
that is being echoed in the Roman emperor cult uh, from the time of Augustus onward. And so this idea of the heavenly luminaries being affected certainly would have rung in the ears of a Roman reader as well as a, uh, an Old Testament reader is, uh, in these things. Uh, Isaiah 13 is an example of this in the Old Testament. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, the moon will not shed its light. Thus I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. Notice the connection there between arrogance and haughtiness and God turning the lights out. Uh, we have noted before that stars and trees and mountains are typical symbols in the Old Testament of things that are high and exalted and therefore arrogant and boastful and proud. And typically what God does to those high things is that he brings them down and humbles them and makes them low. Uh, well, that's the idea here as well. When the thing, the sun is high in the sky, but it won't give its light. That's another way of talking about that same kind of thing. God humbling, God destroying the pride and the arrogance uh, that is symbolized by that. And you really get a sense of that here in Isaiah 13, where it becomes very clear that God turning the lights out is his punishment for their arrogance. And again, it's not a historical event that Isaiah is talking about. It's symbolism of God changing things. Uh, Joel 2.31, Amos 8 and verse 9. Does somebody have uh, either one of those passages? Could turn there and read one of them for us. Joel 2.31 or Amos 8 and verse 9. Who has one of those? Yeah, go ahead. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. And Joel 2.31 is perhaps the more familiar passage. Go ahead. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood for the great and terrible day of Jehovah. And that's a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in AD 70. So um, this day of darkness preceding judgment, same kind of idea here, that it's not going to be the pretty sunny world uh, that you're used to, that God's going to afflict it, and it's going to be clear that this is divine judgment. And darkness, uh, of course, is not chosen at random in the Bible. Darkness is often a symbol for evil and for deception. Uh, John chapter 9, you remember the story of Jesus healing the man that was born blind. And you remember that uh, at the end of that story, there is this little interchange between Jesus and the Pharisees. And Jesus says, I came so that those who see may not see. Uh, to make them blind, as it were, by their arrogance. Acts 13.11 uh, we have that same kind of idea. You might want to put in there Acts 9. What does God do to Saul of Tarsus? Or what does Jesus do to him in Acts 9? Puts him in the dark for three days. Uh, that's not by accident. It is a, a symbol of God's judgment on his wicked life and showing him that you really are in the dark and that you're going to have to come out of that. 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, I have there to compare that. I don't think darkness is mentioned there. But this idea of evil people being deceived and in the dark is part of the idea uh, of God's judgment upon it as well. It is a sign that the world is not right. Like we read in Amos 8 and verse 9, God says, in the middle of the day I'm going to make the sun go dark. If that literally happened, you would think, man, something has really gone wrong someplace. And that is exactly the point that you're supposed to get from it here, that God is going to afflict them in a way that they can't help but notice uh, and it will be clear to them that this is God trying to get their attention. Uh, the disruption of the cosmic order is a reflection of man's disruption of the equally universal moral order obtained by God. And so uh, you get this kind of picture in the Bible in more than one way. Romans chapter 1, the mess that the Romans and the pagans made out of their society is a similar kind of thing. And God is uh, going to allow them to suffer uh, for that. Uh, and of course, the opposite of this, light is usually associated with God in the Bible. 
Uh, the very first thing we hear God say in the Bible is, let there be light. He is the source of light. The Bible says that he dwells in light unapproachable. The Bible says in John 1 that Jesus was the light that came into the world. And so when they are put in the darkness, that is also a way of talking about uh, their separation and their increasing distance from God. And like we have noted, uh, this is something that God regularly does to sinful people. He says, you want to live without me? You want to ignore me? I'll let you try it for a while and just see how far you get and see how miserable things are. So God will allow them to go into the darkness and reap the consequences of their sin. Uh, and so uh, we have then the, uh, the fourth angel and this darkness indicating again God's displeasure, his judgment, his... Uh, his coming uh, display of wrath. Uh, then in verse 13, to end the chapter, then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven. And we should be kind of used to this by now, that before we see the next thing, we get a little bit of an interlude or a pause. And that is, uh, remember, as we studied last week, sometimes for the dramatic effect, but sometimes the pause indicates coming judgment. We noted in chapter 8 and verse 1 that the silence of God uh, is very indicative often of a coming judgment uh, of God. And so here we have kind of a uh, brief pause that is going to highlight the last three, and trumpets five, six, and seven together are called three woes. And so there is a sense in this text that it is getting worse. And again, it's not getting worse in a chronological sense, but the descriptions get more intense as we see that God is not just going to, you know, slap them on the wrist and let them go. The picture that God wants to give uh, to us is that I'm going to get their attention. I'm going to make sure they know what I'm doing. And it is described in these many ways. Uh, this eagle imagery, of course, is rather interesting. It's used throughout the Bible in a couple different ways. Deuteronomy 28 God here, again, remember the blessings and the curses of the law. If you ever disobey me, God says, the Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the, end of, uh, from the end of the earth as the eagle swoops down. It shall eat the offspring of your herd and the produce of your ground until you are destroyed, who also leaves you no grain, no wine uh, or oil, nor the increase of your herd or young flock until they've caused you to perish." just like an eagle, swoops down out of the sky and devours the living things. God says, I'll bring a nation against you that'll come and pick you apart and drain you dry and, and it will consume you. That imagery is interesting. Here we have an eagle flying in mid-heaven saying, woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth. So there is a coming judgment now, are we to identify this eagle with a nation that is coming? Probably not. Uh, the idea is that there is this bird of prey, this hunter that God is uh, uh, released, as it were, to show that judgment is coming. Uh, Jeremiah 4, verse 13, speaking here of uh, God, He goes up like clouds and His chariots like the whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are ruined. Wash your heart from evil, O Jerusalem, that you may be saved. And so God's judgment is like uh, a swift eagle coming and diving on its prey. Jeremiah 49, Behold, he will mount up and swoop like an eagle and spread out his wings against Bozrah, and the hearts of the mighty men of Edom in that day will be like the heart of a woman in labor. It's never good in the Bible when a man is compared to a woman. That's never a good thing. And uh, here you certainly get that sense as well. Uh, they're going to be helpless and crying and uh, in need of, of all kinds of relief. So swooping like an eagle, again, Lamentations 4, 19. Our pursuers, Jeremiah here lamenting the destruction of Jerusalem, our pursuers were swifter than the eagles of the sky. Hosea 8, put the trumpet to your lips like an eagle, the enemy comes against the house of the Lord because they have transgressed. Notice how that passage ends in verse 4, that they have made idols for themselves, that they might be cut off. Remember the interpretive context that we are proposing for the book of Revelation is that the crisis these Christians are facing is the emperor cult of the first century. 
And idolatry is what that's all about. And here we have this image here in a text about idolatry. That one, Deuteronomy 8, is, uh, 28, as we noted as well, the punishment for idolatry is this eagle imagery. Uh, even in Habakkuk, as the Babylonians are drawing near, their horses are swifter than leopards and keener than wolves in the evening. Their horsemen come galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swooping down to devour. All of them come for violence. So I think you get the idea in the biblical side of things what this eagle represents. It means coming destruction. Do you know why uh, the New King James Version uses the word angel? Does it say angel? I imagine it says angel because the rest of the text is full of angels and that some scribe somewhere thought, oh, this has got to be an angel. <laughs> but the oldest manuscripts say eagle. And I think it's the right reading is eagle just based on the imagery here. Not only do we have all this judgment imagery um, from the Old Testament in, the, in terms of an eagle, but if you know anything about the Roman Empire, you know about eagles as well. In the year 102 BC, uh, Gaius Marius decreed that the eagle would be the symbol of the Senate and the people of Rome. And so you see on the coin there, uh, which is very common, uh, the Roman eagle. Uh, di displaying and proclaiming Roman power. That's a Greek coin, by the way, not a Roman coin. So the coin they gave to foreigners showed their power, their eagle. Here's a Roman eagle. I think that came from the, uh, the theater, in, uh, you know, a theater in Syria. But uh, these were typical on the Roman coins. Uh, when, the Roman, whoops, when the Roman legions marched, they always carried with them a thing called a standard. It was a pole that had different things attached to it, like a banner and other things. And at the top of that standard was an eagle. It represented the might and the power of Rome. Uh, and the reason that it was used as a symbol of Roman power is because it was the symbol of the god Jupiter, which is the Greek god Zeus. And in uh, Roman artwork, you will see sometimes Zeus depicted with an eagle at his feet. And so the power of the greatest of their gods became the power of Rome. And even in the literature outside of the Bible, in the book of 4th Ezra, which is a book that we don't have in our Bibles, but is one of those books that the Jews wrote in the intertestamental period, uh, they viewed Rome as an eagle. So there's plenty of background to this as well. And this is something that I think we're going to see a lot more of in the book of Revelation as we go through it, that not only is John using a very well-known Old Testament image, the eagle coming and swooping down, but he's using Old Testament images that also have significance for Rome. And... It's almost as if God is saying, you think you're strong like an eagle? I've got an eagle too. I've got that kind of strength as well. And mine's greater than yours. And my eagle is going to judge your nation. Uh, it is this use of their imagery against them, as it were. And it seems clear to me that any reader in Asia Minor in the first century would have picked up on that immediately. You couldn't look at an eagle in the first century and not think about Rome. That's all there was to it. Um, but there might even be more to it than that. Uh, this cameo carved out of a couple pieces of onyx is a depiction of Tiberius Caesar after his death going to join the gods. And the Romans believed that the soul of the dead emperor was carried to heaven on the back of an eagle. And so when Augustus died, the story is told that there were seen eagles flying in the sky, indicating that he had gone to join the gods. And here you see that same thing uh, being done for uh, Tiberius. He's going up and he is being given the crown by this victory character here. So he's going to be crowned like a god would be and joining them on the back of an eagle. I've shown you pictures already of, the, of Titus in the Arch of Titus that he is depicted in the same way on his arch in Rome. And so there is some of that here as well. The eagle is not only just the symbol of Rome, it is the symbol of Rome in its divinity. 
It's the symbol of the divine emperors, for that is the thing that makes them divine. And it's interesting that God is here taking that image and using it not as a symbol of Rome's greatness and the divinity of their emperors, because that's blasphemous and that's the idolatry that they're being judged for. God's using it as a symbol of judgment against this people. Uh, an eagle, of course, is a bird of prey, flying above to spot its kill. Babylon is described this way in Ezekiel 17, like a great eagle that goes and swoops down and captures nations. And Old Testament covenant curses include, if you've been really bad, that you are given as food to the birds, and therefore the eagle is, is not only a symbol of judgment, but even of death. And yet there is one more thing to it. Uh, the eagle can also be a positive thing for God's people. Exodus 19.4, a familiar passage to us. Speaking here, God brought them out of Egypt, and he said, I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. So the, the image of God coming like an eagle can mean for some people destruction, but for other people safety. And isn't that exactly the picture that we had back in chapter 7? that in the midst of all this destruction going on, that we had this interlude where God says, I'm going to seal my people on their foreheads and I'm going to mark them so that they are not hurt. And so what is a judgment on them is safety uh, for others. Deuteronomy 32, like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, he spread his wings and caught them and carried them on his pinions. The Lord alone guided them, and there was no foreign god with him. And so when we see this eagle here in uh, Revelation chapter 8 and verse 13, uh, it is one of those symbols that is just simply chocked full of meaning. All right, then, uh, let me switch gears here, and let's go into Revelation chapter 9. Then the fifth angel sounded. Now remember these... Uh, Last three trumpets form a special triad, perhaps indicating that God's wrath is now going to be more intensely described, and that is the case. Uh, trumpets 5, 6, and 7 span the next three chapters. And so the first four trumpets were 11 verses. The last three are three chapters. So you can see that we're going to get a lot more detail uh, and more picture here. Um, I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. Uh, this, some of this imagery can get kind of difficult. I don't profess to be able to unravel all of it perfectly, but fallen can suggest something different from descending in biblical language. In chapters 10, 18, and 20, we have angels that descend, indicating that God has sent them to do something. But falling is another thing. Uh, falling is the language that is used in the Old Testament when God judges something. And so the king of Tyre is like a star that has fallen from heaven uh, in Ezekiel. And so what is this star? Well, it appears to be some kind of an angel is it a, an angel that has rebelled? I don't know. Is it Satan? I don't think so. I don't think this is a, a, a depiction of Satan. Uh, but it is some kind of agent of God's judgment. He has been sent, and sent perhaps not in just the ordinary way, but he himself may be an evil, rebellious being that is going to be allowed to unleash more evil and cause suffering on the world uh, as a result of that. Now, interestingly enough, remember the context that we're talking about here. The first century, the Roman Empire. People in Asia Minor, where the emperor cult is the strongest. And there's a possibility, a good possibility, I, I think, that we have here another one of these little hints that these original readers would have picked up on. Uh, the Roman poet Manilius uh, wrote a poem on astronomy and, of course, in the first century, all these Roman poets are writing to praise Augustus, like Virgil and others. And here's what he says about Augustus Caesar. Augustus, like a star, 
has fallen to our world, greatest lawgiver on earth and in heaven thereafter. And so it's like one of the gods has come down to us, and Augustus is that great. It's almost as if God is saying, you want to start to fall out of the sky and come down to you? I can arrange that, but you're not going to like what happens. It's not going to be what you think it is. And so it, it puts that negative twist on something that the Romans themselves, I think, uh, would have recognized. And not only that quotation from a, a Roman poet, but that kind of imagery on coins and other things was very common uh, as the way the Roman emperors pr uh, portrayed themselves. But be that as it may, in verse 1, uh, the key of the abyss or the bottomless pit is given to him. Uh, the abyss is one of those things in the Bible that we wish we were told more about, but it seems to be the abode of evil and a place of terror. In Luke 8.31, when Jesus begins his ministry and runs into some uh, a guy that is possessed by a demon. Remember, the demon says, are you going to throw us into the, the abyss, Jesus? And uh, apparently that's where they had come from. Same kind of thing in Luke 10 and verse 7. Uh, in Old Testament passages, it is stated in absolute parallelism with the abode of the dead, Sheol, a place of terror and darkness. And so this awful place, this place of evil and death and darkness, this agent of God, whatever it is, is given the key to unleash it on the earth. And a key is a symbol of power and authority. And so he opens the bottomless pit in verse 2, and smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace which should immediately remind us maybe of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 19.28 says the smoke from Sodom rose like the smoke of a great furnace, kind of like something being completely burned up by uh, intense heat. And so here we have this, this image of destruction. Uh, and like Sodom, this bottomless pit is kind of like a place full of evil where everyone there is condemned by God. The smoke comes up on the earth, the uh, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. And again, we're back to darkness again, like we were with the fourth uh, trumpet. So again, it's not chronological. It's a, just the, another picture on, of the same thing. Here we have this symbol that God is going to make the world... Uh, a dreary place uh, by this judgment. God is going to unleash evil upon the world, as it were, and allow it to do what it does. And we're going to see at the end of the chapter that God is still going to try to get them to repent, that this is not the end. We're going to see the end later on, but the last verse in chapter 9 is that after God did all of these things, they still did not repent. And so we've had a third of things, and a fourth of things uh, affected and destroyed. Same kind of thing here, that this is not the end of the Roman Empire, but it is God unleashing his fury against it to try to get their attention. Now, out of the smoke, verse 3, come locusts upon the earth. You never know what's going to come out of a fire and smoke in apocalyptic language. And here we get these demonic locusts. And if you're familiar with the Old Testament, of course, uh, the first thing that comes to your mind is the great plague of locusts in Joel chapters 1 and 2, where we see this great horde of locusts unleashed as judgment of God against a sinful people. Uh, they are mentioned in other places as well, though, in Deuteronomy 28, 14, and 38, again in that passage where God says, if you ever disobey me and make foreign idols, here's all the things I'm going to do to you. And on that list twice is mentioned that God's going to send locusts and eat up all their crops. And of course, uh, maybe even before Joel 2 comes to mind, the eighth plague on Egypt where God sends the locusts uh, on them. Does somebody have uh, Exodus 10 and could read verse 15? Exodus 10, 15. Go ahead. For they covered the surface of the whole land, so that the land was darkened, and they ate every plant in the land, and all the fruit of the trees and the animal left. 
Thus nothing green was left on tree or plant of the field through all the land of Egypt. This idea of it all becoming dark because of the locusts, that's what we have here. Not just the land now, this is the sky turning dark. Uh, and so locusts come out, this symbol of judgment and destruction, and power was given to them as the scorpions of the earth, uh, like scorpions to bring pain and suffering. Uh, the scorpion is a common image in the ancient world of something very painful. In 1 Kings 12, when Rehoboam comes to the throne of Israel, he says, my father disciplined you with whips, I will discipline you with scorpions. It's going to be worse. And so the idea of a scorpion is something painful. Notice here also something very unusual in verse 4. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth or any green thing nor any tree. Now that's not normally what locusts do. That's normally exactly what they do. These locusts, however, do the opposite of what is normal. They affect not the plant life, but people. Uh, there is that passage in Amos 8 about there's being a famine for the word of God and judgment coming as a result of that. That kind of image here that this is not a literal locust plague, but a plague upon men for their disobedience. Uh, they are only to hurt the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads from chapter 7. So this is God clearly going against them. Those who are sealed, of course, are not harmed. They are kept safe. Remember in the plagues on Egypt that the Israelites had light in their dwellings when the Egyptians didn't, that the Israelites were able to drink water when the Egyptians couldn't, and so forth. God protects his people. Deuteronomy 8, he led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water. He brought water out for you from the flint, uh, or from the rock of flint. So God's people live in a world of scorpions, as it were, a world where God's anger is unleashed against wickedness. But it's not directed at his people, and they're not called upon to suffer uh, as part of the judgment of God. So it's a message of comfort beyond all of these things. They were not permitted to kill anyone, verse 5, but to torment for five months. And it says that their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. In those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die and death flees from them. Uh, there is kind of a thread of this in the Old Testament as well, that not only when people became idolatrous would God inflict them in just merely external ways, but God would also drive them crazy, as it were. He would make them wish that they were dead. In Deuteronomy 28, in verse 28, again in that list of curses of the law, uh, starting in verse 28, the Lord will smite you with madness and with blindness and with bewilderment of heart. You will grope at noon as the blind man gropes in darkness. You will not prosper in your ways but you will be oppressed and robbed continually with no one to save you. Look at verse 34. You will be driven mad by the sight of what you see. Uh, verse 65. Among these nations you shall find no rest. There will be no resting place for the sole of your foot. The Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing of eyes, despair of soul. Your life will hang in doubt before you, and you will be in dread night and day and have no assurance of your life. Just the worry and the anxiety and the fear that comes with living under God's judgment, uh, God brings that upon these people as well. And of course, all of this imagery, the, the darkness and the locusts and the, the fire mixed with hail that we saw in one of the early trumpets, all of this plague imagery certainly keeps us thinking about that great judgment on Egypt and remember that God was basically destroying their worldview, not just their world, but their worldview. That the things that you've come to trust in can't be trusted. Your gods cannot save you. Your gods are not gods at all. Well, that's the very kind of thing that God is going to try to show to these pagans here. That this thing that you call a god, the Roman emperor, is not a god. And he's going to be powerless to stop what I do. And so... 
that's always in the background. John is here dismantling trust in the emperor cult and showing that God can judge this God and take him down as well. Uh, the mention of five months, nobody seems to know what five months uh, represents here. And maybe it's just, therefore, not even proper to ask. Maybe it's just, that's how long locusts normally did their thing. Maybe that's how long locusts live. Maybe that's how long the dry season was. Maybe that's just a number that John pulled out of a hat. I don't know. You can see the, the names of the different uh, scholars here who have grappled with this. Uh, they have no idea of what it means, and I'm certainly not going to venture a guess either. Um, any questions or observations that you have down through verse 6 here, these scorpions in this great plague? Yeah. Going back to the fallen star angel thing, I was confused. You said the fallen indicated judgment, but then you said that it represented an angel that was God's agent. Mm -hmm. I think that it's, that it's God is going to allow some kind of evil being to do his evil, and that evil is a punishment and a judgment. Kind of like in Romans 1, where God gave them over to their passions to let them wallow in their misery. That's what I would say. Any other thoughts here? Do you think that the same uh, personality referred to in verse 11, the king over them, the angel of the abyss? That's a good question. I don't know if it's the same one or not. What do you think? I'll say yes. Okay. I'll say no, I'll say no then. Okay. <laughs> uh there is debate about that, um, whether he's the, the, the fallen star or not. I, I don't know. Any other questions I can't answer? Those are the easy ones. <clears throat> All right. Well, we're not done with the locust. Verse 7, the appearance of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. War horses in the ancient world. Uh, you'd be surprised how much literature has been written about Roman horses. There's just more than you would care to know, probably, unless you're a horse lover. Uh, but apparently, Roman war horses were what we today would call draft horses. Things like Clydesdales, big horses. Those are the kinds of horses they rode into battle. Uh, but in Joel 2, 4 through 7, their appearance, this is that locust plague in Joel, their appearance is like the appearance of horses like war horses. So you can see that John is using that imagery here. Jeremiah 8 and verse 16, from Dan is heard the snorting of his horses at the sound of the neighing of his stallions, the whole land quakes. They come and devour the land. So you get this mixed imagery uh, like a locust plague would devour, so the horses come and devour. It's just this picture of something strong and mighty that can't be uh, conquered. Having a, a war horse on a battlefield was like having a Sherman tank on a battlefield, you know, in modern times. Uh, lots of description here. It says that they were, in verse 7, on their heads appeared to be crowns like gold, perhaps suggesting that they are going to conquer the evil people, beat them down. Uh, we are told that they, uh, their faces were like the faces of men and that they had hair like the hair of women. I don't know. I don't know. <clears throat> I'll just say that right now. Some have suggested that it's just to make them look wild, that they have long hair. Who knows? But it's certainly weird here. And um, with their teeth, their teeth are like the teeth of lions. Again, Old Testament imagery. A nation has invaded my land, mighty without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion. Strong, fatal, uh, terrifying. Breastplates, they have breastplates, as it were, of iron. The sound of their wings is like the sound of chariots. Many horses rushing. A chariot charge in the ancient world was absolutely unstoppable. You could not stand against one. And so uh, that's this army. It's going to come, it's going to do its damage, and there is nobody that can stop it. Uh, it says that in verse 10, they have tails like scorpions. So we've already seen the comparison with scorpions, so they're here to harm. They have stings. In their tail is their power to hurt men for five months, whatever five months means. Uh, kind of like 
Jeremiah, lift up a signal, blow the trumpet. We have the trumpet sounding here. Um, Bring up the horses like bristly locusts. And it seems that John is simply expanding on that. They have as king over them, verse 11, the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in the Greek he has the name Apollyon. Uh, Abaddon is another word that is used in the Old Testament for the, the abode of the dead. Apollyon is a Greek word that means destroyer. Both words, Apollyon and Abaddon, have the sense of destruction. That uh, this king, his name is death, destruction, mayhem, chaos, you know, you name it, that's the idea. Uh, He is destruction personified, as it were. And again, probably not a particular angelic being, maybe, but this picture that God is going to unleash evil on these evil people. I'd like to finish, though, tonight with going back to this Roman emperor cult, because you can't help but hear the name Apollo as you say the word Apollyon. It's very, very close. As a matter of fact, they come from the same Greek word. Is there an allusion here to the Greek god Apollo? Let me suggest to you uh, the possibility, even if you don't buy it all. Uh, Apollo was a prominent god of the Roman Empire. He appears often on Roman coins, and one of his symbols is the swan, and that has to do with the mythology associated with Apollo that we don't need to go into, but he is often depicted with a swan like you see him there. The first temple that Augustus built as the emperor, the first emperor of Rome was a temple to Apollo in 28 BC, and he himself portrayed himself as Apollo in a statue, there was a famous dinner party that, uh, that uh, Augustus had one time in which he showed up dressed as Apollo. Apollo became kind of the patron god of Augustus. This is the great altar of peace that Augustus built to commemorate his victory in war. And you see the swan there indicating his connection with Apollo. Uh, he is referred to in literature as the son of Apollo. At least his official biographer referred to him that way. But Augustus isn't the only of the Roman emperors to associate himself with Apollo. Nero had a gigantic statue of himself made in the form of Apollo, and it used to stand right outside the Colosseum. The reason the Colosseum is called the Colosseum is because that statue was called the Colossus of Nero. That statue was probably about 43 feet tall. The place where it stood is still outside the Colosseum there, if you ever get to go see it. And so people looking at the emperor like Apollo was nothing unusual. Here's a coin of Nero, Nero on the front, Apollo on the back, kind of his way of saying same person. Here is a painting from Pompeii in which Nero is depicted as the god Apollo. Uh, Here is a coin of Augustus. The front says Augustus, son of the divine one. On the back is Apollo, the god that gave him his victory at Actium. One more slide and we'll be done. One of Apollo's attributes was Parnopius, the expeller of locusts. And there was a statue of him with this designation in the city of Athens. Let me suggest to you that Apollyon and the locust is another one of these swipes at the Roman emperor. And that the locust imagery and the similar sounding name of Apollyon suggests that this is meant to be understood as a criticism of Rome and her emperors who associated themselves with Apollo. Uh, We are out of time. The bell is rung. Uh, So we will pick up with uh, verse 12 and the next trumpet, the sixth trumpet next time. Thanks for your good attention.